Welcome back to precinct training for the Republican Party of Bear County. Uh, this is Alan Hamilton and we are on module six. This is the last of the six modules. Learning is an exciting adventure. And I like this recently I found from Martin Luther King Jr. Nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. And Edmund Burke said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men, and that includes women, to do nothing. So again, welcome to module training for precinct chairs. And as I've mentioned before, there are two ways to view the material. There's a PDF version, which is the slides only, which you can certainly download and copy and put together a notebook. And there's the MP4 version, video version, which you're watching right now. If you have any questions, get a hold of us at GOP or uh, BearGOP.org or call us at 210-824-9445. Have a great day. In each of the modules, we try to devote a little bit of time to one or more of the Founding Fathers. In this module, we're going to look a little bit at John Adams and his wife, Abigail. And here's some quotes. One useless man is a shame two is a law firm, and three is a Congress. And by the way, a group of baboons is not called a Congress. Don't use that. It's very disrespectful, disrespectful to the baboons. There are two ways to conquer and enslave a country. One is by the sword. The other is by debt. And that seems to be the direction we're moving in. Power always thinks that it is doing God's service when it is violating all his laws. Boy, have we seen that throughout history. And the true source of our sufferings has been our timidity. We need to be bold and courageous. Here's some action steps for module six. Continue to revisit and revise your vision statement from module one. That should help to keep you on course. And <clears throat> we talked back in module one about having a big why. Number two, picture our county executive committee meetings with more unity. And three, keep reviewing the handouts for Robert's Rules of Order. We covered that in the last session. That's gonna take some work. And if you'll devote a little bit of time each week, you'll really come a long way. And number four, let us know if there's anyone that would like to become a precinct chair. So here's an overview of what we'll cover in module number six. So we'll look at John and Abigail Adams. I've kind of given some brief history of them, some highlights. We'll look at the importance of prayer. We'll look at the first prayer that, uh, or the prayer that opened the first Congress. We'll talk about how to dress your polling location. That would be for your primary and general elections. We'll talk about how to run your precinct convention. We'll give you some keys, some suggestions on using social media and using the Excel spreadsheet that's called Be The One, where we can report back to headquarters on how we're doing. And then I put together some final thoughts. I talk a little bit about fifth generation warfare, the Uniparty versus MAGA, and how do we win? And finally, I gave you some book recommendations. And also at the website, you'll find a folder that's called Handouts for Precinct Chair Training. And you can go there. I've put a number of items in there as well. So here's a brief bio on John Adams. He certainly was considered one of our founding fathers and is called, was called the father of the American Navy. He was the first vice president of the United States and the second president of the United States. He was a signer of the Treaty of Paris, which ended the Revolutionary War. In 1751, he entered Harvard College at the age of 16, and he did have plans to be a minister and then later uh, determined he would rather go into law. In 1764, he married Abigail Smith, who was a minister's daughter. In 1765, he wrote a dissertation opposing the Stamp Act. In 1770, he represented some British soldiers involved in the Boston Massacre. massacre and he uh, w was pretty unpopular for a while because of that decision. In 1774, he was a Massachusetts delegate to the First Continental Congress. He nominated George Washington to lead the Continental Army, and he organized the Committee of Five <clears throat> to, uh, 
to draft the Declaration of Independence. In 1780, he drafted the Massachusetts Constitution. He wrote Thoughts on Government, which became a guidebook for other state constitutions. And he was known for his bulldog temperament and emotional outbursts. He died on July 4th, 1826, the same day as Thomas Jefferson, which was the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. He foresaw the failure of the French Revolution due to its anti-religious vigor. And a little bit about his wife, Abigail. She is considered a founding mother of the revolution, and she played a significant role in John's career, and she set the stage and standards for many of the first ladies that came after her. And she has a wonderful book about her with her correspondence with John, which is a fun read. It may come as a surprise for many Americans to learn that our country began with prayer. Three years before Valley Forge, America's first official act towards independence took place in Philadelphia at Carpenter's Hall. The First Continental Congress could not meet at the Pennsylvania State House, which today is known as Independence Hall, because their deliberations were considered too radical for the Pennsylvania legislature, who actively supported King George. However, the local Carpenters Guild was willing to offer their newly constructed building, Carpenters Hall, as a place to gather. They were in Philadelphia because of the crisis growing in Boston. British soldiers had occupied the town and British warships controlled the harbor and were restricting trade in and out of Boston. What could they do? Well, they gathered in Philadelphia and the very first Congress opened with prayer. From John Adams' letter to his wife, Abigail, written from Philadelphia on September 16, 1774. When Congress first met, Mr. Cushing made a motion that it should be opened with prayer. It was opposed by Mr. Jay of New York and Mr. Rutledge of South Carolina because we were so divided in religious sentiments, some Episcopalians, some Quakers, some Anabaptists, some Presbyterians, and some Congregationalists that we should not join in the same act of worship. Mr. Samuel Adams arose and said he was no bigot and could hear a prayer from a gentleman of piety and virtue who was at the same time a friend to his country. He was a stranger in Philadelphia, but had heard that Mr. Deshay deserved that character. And therefore he moved that Mr. Deshay, an Episcopal clergyman, might be desired to read prayers to the Congress tomorrow morning. The motion was seconded and, and seconded and passed in the affirmative. Accordingly, next morning he appeared with his clerk and in his pontificals and read several prayers in the established form and then read the collect for the seventh day of September, which was the 35th Psalm. You must remember this was the next morning after we had heard the horrible rumor of the cannonade of, Bas of Boston. I never saw a greater effect upon an audience. It seemed as if heaven had ordained that psalm to be read on that morning. After this, Mr. Deshay, unexpectedly to everybody, struck out into an extemporary prayer, which filled the bosom of every man present. I must confess I never heard a better prayer or one so well pronounced. He prayed with such fervor, such earnestness and pathos and in language so elegant and sublime for America, for the Congress, for the province of Massachusetts Bay, and especially the town of Boston. It has had an excellent effect upon everybody here. This is a painting of what that assembly may have looked like. Reverend Jacob Duchesne, Rector of Christ Church of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. September 7th, 1774, at 9 a.m. Our Lord, our Heavenly Father, high and mighty, King of kings, Lord of lords, who does from thy throne behold all dwellers upon the earth and reignest with power supreme and uncontrolled over all kingdoms, empires, and governments. Look down in mercy, we beseech thee, on these our American states, who have fled to thee from the rod of the oppressor and thrown themselves upon thy gracious protection. 
desiring to be henceforth dependent only on thee. To thee have they appealed for the righteousness of their cause. To thee do they now look for that countenance and support which thou alone canst give. Take them, therefore, Heavenly Father, under thy nurturing care. Give them wisdom and counsel and valor in the field. Defeat the malicious designs of our cruel adversaries. Convince them of the unrighteousness of their cause, and if they persist in their sanguinary purposes, O oh, let the voice of thine own unerring justice, sounding in their hearts, constrain them to drop their weapons of war from their unnerved hands in the day of battle. Be thou present, O oh God of wisdom, and direct the counsels of this honorable assembly. Enable them to settle things upon the best and surest foundation, that the scene of blood may speedily be closed, that order, harmony, and peace may be effectually restored, and truth and justice, religion and piety prevail and flourish amongst thy people. Preserve the health of their bodies and the vigor of their minds. Shower on them and the millions they here represent such temporal blessings as thou seest expedient for them in this world, and crown them with everlasting glory in the world to come. All this we ask in the name and through the merits of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Savior. Amen. This was one of those moments in history that captured the moving of God's spirit. Washington was there with Patrick Henry, John Randolph, Richard Henry Lee, and John Jay, along with John and Samuel Adams of Massachusetts. And all 56 delegates from every colony except Georgia attended. John Adams wrote, it was enough to melt a heart of stone. I saw the tears gush into the eyes of the old grave Pacific Quaker Quakers of Philadelphia. The scripture read by Reverend Duchesne, ordained by God, and then spontaneously prayed, inspired a group of patriots who began the deliberation on their knees. This is what must happen. Oh, may the Spirit of God fill delegates and move our congressional halls again. Dr. Paul J. Lee. Let us recite the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And let us also say the pledges to the American flag and the Texas flag. First, the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And to the Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. If you have printed out the PDF version from the previous modules, may I suggest that you take some time and look over what you have learned so far. Abigail Gadam said, learning is not attained by chance. It must be sought for with ardor and diligence. So take a little time and just look through your notes before continuing. Well, we've certainly had this before. You probably recognize this slide. But again, this came up because of a story I heard about Vince Lombardi at his football training camps. At the very beginning, he would hold up a football and he would say, this is a football. And yes, we're still continuing to go through the basics and we wanna be a master of the fundamentals. So let's take a look about dressing your polling location. 
So the first thing I want to remind you is that election day is a fairly long day. It runs about 16 hours long. So please be kind and respectful to the judges, the clerks, and the poll watchers that are working. The election judges should put up markers that show where you can put political signs. Do your talking and have out election suggestions beyond those markers. Note, when you go inside to use the restrooms, make sure you're not wearing anything political. A plain red shirt is okay, or if you're wearing something that's political, you can probably turn your shirt inside out. So if you're at the polling location, the first thing is to look your best, and that mainly means to smile. It definitely will improve your face value. And try not to be offensive. Many still cannot see that America was better with Trump. I think that they're coming to that conclusion rather rapidly, though. Some may still be bothered by his tweets, but it's amazing how so many are fine with present-day trannies and tyranny. And don't wait for them to initiate the conversation. So speak up. Would you like a list of conservative candidates? Be friendly and helpful. And one of the things I enjoy to do, especially if there's kids, is I like to tell dad jokes. It's a great way to break the ice. So here's a couple of pictures that I found. The one at the top is in front of a house, obviously. Um, I suppose that could be a school or a church or something like that. But again, it's the, the signs are nicely laid out. And then below that is one that we often see at polling locations, which is just, uh, uh, more is definitely not better. Now, if you arrive early, you, you know, one of the things I've done is sometimes I'll move around some of the Republican signs to make it look more pleasant. Um, my polling location is the Hidden Forest Elementary School. And there's even some chain link fence there. And I'm able to take some zip ties and attach the uh, signs to the fence. And again, remember before you leave, make sure that you pick up and clean up after yourself. So this is Hidden Forest Elementary. This is the voting location that I usually go to on election day. Uh, the building directly in front is their gymnasium, which makes for a really nice uh, polling location. They can set up shop there and set up the machines quite easily. Um, you'll notice there's some fencing on the right. Uh, at times I've put some signs on there. Um, and again, this is all going to be just outside of one of the uh, election markers telling me where I can put up election signs. So here's a picture of where I sit. Um, I usually bring some shade. That's pretty beneficial in San Antonio if it's hot out. I have a couple of chairs. I've got something to drink. Um, and I usually will take some snacks. Um, my wife will often bring me some lunch. And if I get real thirsty or want to refill my Bill Miller mug, there is a water fountain in the gymnasium, which is nice. I usually bring a book to read and I take time to visit with people. So this is kind of what my setup looks like. And here's a couple of homemade signs that I made. Uh, I think you can tell that uh, this is legal paper that I was able to print on. And this was helpful. This is what I did when I was originally running for Prinksick Chair. And I put some of my suggestions there. Um, so again, just to give you an idea of some things that you can do. So let's take a little time and talk about how to hold a precinct convention. And generally that's gonna be after the poll closes on the primary. So our next primary will be on Tuesday, March the 5th, and therefore the conventions would generally begin around 7.30 that night. And the default, precinct, the default location would be your precinct voting center. And you'll need to check with uh, the county to see what that is. Again, sometimes that changes from election to election. So just double check on that. And you can go to Bear County Elections, which is at bear.org. And I have found often that they're not very good at posting the, day, the locations during election day. Um, they spend more time focusing on early voting. But after early voting is closed, you can generally go there and find out where uh, election day uh, locations are. So let's go over the process for a precinct convention. 
The first thing that happens is that our Republican Party will put together all of the forms necessary in a manila class envelope, and they'll deliver them to the county election department. The county election department will then see that they're delivered to the assigned precinct locations. And again, sometimes that changes. So check with bear.org and make sure that you understand where the assigned precinct locations will be. The precinct chair can then pick that up anytime after 3 p.m. for review. And if there is no precinct chair, then any Republican who would like to run the precinct convention may pick them up when the polls close. So you show up at your assigned precinct location after the polls close to conduct the convention. And here's a note, I make it a point to be at the polling location all day. And I tell people about the precinct convention and that it will be held after the polls close. You'll be amazed how many people have never heard of this. And this year, I'm thinking of doing it at a location other than the polling location. So what I'll do is I'll make up a little sign and I'll make sure that that's posted to the window um, where, the, the, where the voting is taking place so that they'll know where to show up to participate in the convention. It's interesting how many people are afraid to do a precinct convention for the first time. So I'm trying to make, not make this too light, but again, I was reminded of uh, the, the, the TV show when I was growing up called Lost in Space. And there was a robot there that would often say danger, Will Robinson. So again, you can do this. Remember, fear stands for false evidence appearing real. So let's talk about running the precinct convention. So the first thing is to open the envelope and look over the forms and the instructions. And the second thing you'll do is to elect a convention chairman. So you'll ask those who are there who they would like to nominate. And if more than one is nominated, you can settle that by a show of hands. And really, if you are there, they will most likely pick you because they think you know what you are doing. Proverbs 17:28 says that even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he is considered perceptive. So we're still talking about the process. There's four more things to do. Number one is you'll fill out an attendance sheet of those who have attended the, the convention. And you can certainly pass that around and have each person fill it out for themselves. Then you'll also fill out a senatorial delegate form. And this is for those who would like to be delegates at the senatorial convention. You may have to explain this a little bit. And the next senatorial convention is scheduled for Saturday, March the 23rd. So that would be, of course, after the primary. And ask anyone if they would like to submit a resolution or multiple resolutions. And there should be some blank resolution forms in the envelope. If someone does, they can use a blank form or one they have brought. And you're gonna put all of that into the packet. And then as the chairman, it's your responsibility, responsibility to return that to our Bear GOP headquarters. Also in this module, let's take a little time and talk about using social media. So here's some suggestions to improve the results with social media. Basically, you wanna try something, refine it, and then repeat. There is a learning curve to social media. It takes courage, persistence, and humility. Courage to try new and different things. Persistence to continue when things don't go the way you thought they would. And humility to keep learning from your mistakes. Number one, what do you want to accomplish? Do you wanna make a big splash that draws attention to you personally? Or do you wanna cause a rising tide that lifts all the boats in a good way? If fame and fortune are your goal, you might wanna reevaluate your motives. It is human nature to wanna to be well-liked. Maturity seeks to help and benefit others. So we're still talking about social media, try, refine, and repeat. Number two, more is not always better. So are you endeavoring to reach influencers or are you trusting that bigger and more is better? I've observed that there are kind of two 
two kinds of marketing. There are shepherds and there are ranchers. Now shepherds tend to take care of each member of their flock. Ranchers just turn the cattle loose and visit them once in a while to make sure they have food and water. Now a great life is more than surviving. So how often have you reached out personally to those on your email list or your phone list? Many have seen better results from one-on-one -on -one marketing than from a shotgun, shotgun blast. And that is why in election uh, results, block walking gets better results. So number three, what is it that you're offering? You know, today we are truly inundated with things to allure our visual attention. Someone once asked why they didn't read more. They replied, well, phones ring, but books don't. So remember the old saying, a person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. And Jesus taught that the second commandment is to love your neighbor. Mahatma Gandhi said that he loved what Jesus taught. He just had a hard time with Christians. People will care what you know when they first know that you care. People generally can see through phonies. And people today have a sense that something is very wrong, but they can't quite seem to put their finger on it. So gently encourage them. So here's a suggestion on improving your results with social media. Number four, understand your purpose and mission. You know, we have two ears and one mouth, and we often win more hearts by listening than by telling. The same goes for the content we post. A little well-written goes a long way. And we should think about, are we building relationships and coalitions or just trying to bang a loud gong? Number five, it helps to know your target audience. Those most successful don't rely on social media to build their audience. They also speak in public and provide a service that people want. Social media is then being used as a place for those who already know you. They're checking in to see what you're doing. This has been the allure of Facebook. Over time, people see that your walk matches your talk. People are attracted to genuine people. It is also very refreshing. The next thing I'd like to cover in module six is a little bit about be the one. So be the one is a way that we can communicate back with party headquarters to give them an idea of how we're doing. So as a party, we would like to see greater voter turnout. We also want to increase the number of financial supporters. We call them sustaining members. Be the one helps us see what is working and what is not. Be the one helps us track our progress and how many contacts we are making each week. We'll get better results when we play as a team. So this helps us as a team. It also will help you as an individual to track your progress. So in Be The One, we track how many contacts we've made. So what, what is a contact? A contact is any effort or action that moves the ball towards electing our candidates so that it would include every phone call we make, every text message we send, uh, if we're putting out door hangers, how many door hangers we passed out. Uh, as we're talking to people, how many people did we talk to while block walking? And yes, you can include, if you talk to somebody on the sidewalk between houses, you can count that. And it talks about people you chat with about the upcoming election. That can be any time during the day at, at uh, restaurants uh, and other places that you meet people. Note. It can be your individual effort or the efforts of your whole team. So if you're keeping track of your team, just have them um, put, put that on a, a piece of paper with tick marks, and then you can include that as well. So what are some of the resources that we have available? Well, we can get push cards from headquarters, and we can also use the resources of businesses to support the Bear GOP. Um, we can conduct surveys. We can use this for gathering information and encouraging people to go to the polls. And we can also use the GOP database spreadsheets. And there again, you need to be able to log in to get a list from our executive administrator. When entering information on Be The One, make sure that you first set it to editing. So how do we log 
on to be the one. Well, we're going to go to beargop.org and we're going to look for the tab that says our county party. And then under that, we're going to select precinct chair resources. And then we go to tools and resources. And then finally, we're going to go to precinct chair reporting. Now, at present, the password for be the one is be the one. And again, it's capital B E, capital T H E, capital O N E. And again, it's case sensitive. Then you're going to select your county location, which will be one, two, three, or four. And again, that's going to be the first number of your precinct and that will take you to the correct spreadsheet for you to enter the information. So this will give you an idea of what the spreadsheet will look like. Um, again in the upper right hand corner you'll see the red arrow pointing to editing. You want to make sure that you have the editing turned on and then you're just going to scroll down until you find your particular precinct. So again I've got mine highlighted there 3102 and then you can fill in the total number of contacts and any monies that you've raised for uh, for the party and especially if you've been able to add any sustaining members. So we're coming to the end of module number six and the training as a precinct chair and I just wanted to put together some final thoughts to help us understand what we are up against. Let us remember that this battle may look like it's Republican versus Democrat, but that is not the whole picture. This battle has been waging for many decades, maybe centuries. As a country, we started to see some large cracks appear around 1913. World War I started the next year, probably just a coincidence. Then we had the Great Depression, which brought us to World War II. And after that crisis, the stage was ripe for Roosevelt's New Deal and then Johnson's Great Society. Then came the 60s. Two Kennedys were shot and Martin Luther King Jr. as well. Then the Clintons came to power in Arkansas and then with his election, they brought their corruption to Washington, D.C. Then we had the presidencies of the two Bushes and the Obamas, and now we have the Bidens. We are on a roll. We did get a short reprieve with Trump and the Trump years. It's interesting to note that after Reagan was elected and he finished at his presidency, that the establishment worked very hard to undo everything that Reagan had done. Biden and the swamp are trying to undo what President Trump did. Now we're looking down the barrel of World War III and the hegemony of the administrative state. What a significant time to be alive. Each of us has a part to play. With God's help, we can win this battle. So here's a picture of, I believe, three major world leaders. To the left, you have Justin Trudeau. I'm not exactly sure who the one in the center is. And then you have Klaus Schwab, who's in charge of the World Economic Forum. And it's amazing how they all seem to be getting along just fine. One phrase you may have heard about is called fifth generation warfare. So what is fifth generation warfare? Well, it's been described as a war of information and perception. Another word would be propaganda. In Nazi Germany, the education system was used to indoctrinate the German youth with an anti-Semitic ideology. Joseph Goebbels said, if you repeat a lie often enough, people will believe it and you will even come to believe it yourself. He also said if you tell a lie long enough, it becomes the truth. Well, it actually doesn't. It's still a lie, but people no longer recognize it. So what are the, some of the things that would be included with fifth generation warfare? We have daily propaganda where they are constantly telling you what is right. And of course, what is right now is what was wrong before. Then you have indoctrination. So you don't even really know what is right any longer. Then you have a bombardment of social media constantly telling you what you're supposed to think. And there'll be an abundance of false and misleading advertising. You also have misinformation and disinformation. And that also includes biological warfare, which we could also call pseudoscience. 
So what is fifth generation warfare? Well, one of the phrases that I've been hearing lately is called being black pilled. They are throwing so much at us that many are tempted to throw up their hands in frustration and give up. You know, we are in a fight worth fighting. The Revolutionary War lasted from April 19th, 1775 to September 3rd, 1783. That's a long eight years. And Valley Forge was especially trying. I sometimes wonder how George Washington persevered. I believe prayer played a large part and believing their cause was just. He wanted to be on God's side, not begging God to be on our side. Here's a slide that I originally put in the overview to the module training. So that goes back a little while, but I asked the question, who said this? Men by their constitutions are naturally divided into two parties. First, there are those who fear and distrust the people and wish to draw all powers from them into the hands of the higher classes. And then you have those who identify themselves with the people who have confidence in them. They cherish and consider them as the most honest and safe, although they may not always be the wisest depository of the public interests. He also said in every country, these two parties exist. In every one where they are free to speak, think and write, they will declare themselves. Call them therefore by whatever name you please. They are the same parties and they still pursue the same object. Thomas Jefferson wrote this around 1824. His presidency ran from 1801 to 1809. He served two terms. So 15 years after serving as president, this was his view. You could say is 2020 hindsight for what was true of men and governments. The same is still true today. No matter how things change, some things stay the same. Sacred writings tell us there's nothing new under the sun. As we begin, let us be aware of one of the great constants in life, human nature. When our founders met to determine what kind of government would ensure the safety and freedom of the people, they understood and took into account man's human nature with its tendencies and failings. Therefore, they put in checks and balances because they knew that man was prone to be greedy, easily corrupted by power, and self-interested. In other words, he would take care of himself first before taking care of others. As we look around, we see that there are still two parties in the United States today. Number one, we see an emerging uniparty. And the uniparty is made up of many groups, but it's controlled by a global corporate elite. The slogan of the French Revolution was liberty, equality, fraternity. Today, we've renamed that hope and change and build back better. The French Revolution was a warning shot for what happens when we leave out the Creator, who is the source of providence. Fortunately, our founders did not. Then we see another party, the Make America Great Party. And it's made up of those who would like to see us get back to the way our country was founded. Our country was settled by those seeking religious freedom, and it was built on Judeo-Christian values. They had a biblical worldview. Many today know in their hearts that something is not right. In fact, we're seeing former Democrats and classical liberals leaving their political homes and coming over to the grassroots Republican Party. Yes, we are in a fight. In the movie, The Wizard of Oz, Toto knew what was going on. He pulled back the curtain for all to see. You know, light is a good antiseptic and truth is a great tonic. What do the globalists want? They want a different kind of two-party system. In Canada, there is a Liberal Party of Canada and the Conservative Party of Canada. There is very little ideological separation between the two parties. In the United Kingdom, there is the Conservatives and the Labour Party. They both agree on everything except a few areas of tax policy. In Australia, there is the Australian, Australian Labour Party and the Liberal National Party. And both of these welcomed the COVID police state 
and the CCP-style lockdowns. In New Zealand, there's the Labour Party and the National Party. They have both worked together to transform their country into a prison island. What can we do? We need to recognize who the enemy is, demonic forces working through people. We need to know the truth and share it with others. We want to return power to we the people. That is why there has been a great emphasis on prayer in these modules. Prayer works. We are trusting God that our cause is righteous. It is not so much about God being on our team as it is working in line with his plans and being on his team. So how do we win? Well, we win by joining together in unity. We win, we win by using our God-given talents and abilities towards a common goal of saving our country and against our common enemy. We win by not fighting amongst ourselves. We win by recognizing the traps and snares of those who oppose us. We win by learning how to defund their efforts. We win by speaking up and showing up. We win by encouraging each other to continue to stay in the battle. For we fight not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers in high places. We do believe in providence. It is showing itself as it did during the Revolutionary War. We are believing for a rebirth of freedom across this great land. We believe in a great awakening of truth, and it is springing up in the hearts of patriots. The bell of liberty is ringing. Pulpits and patriots are heeding the call and coming forth to hold up the torch of freedom and banners of justice in our fight against tyranny. With God's help, we will win if we faint not. This was read to the troops while they were stationed at Valley Forge. It was a harsh winter. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of men and women. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we have been too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to pull a proper place, how to put a proper place upon its goods. And it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. That was written by Thomas Paine in December 23rd, 1776. So let's take a minute to sum things up. First of all, it has been a joy and a learning experience for me to get to know many of you better. We are fighting for our families, our kids, and our grandkids. And we simply want freedoms we already have as inalienable rights. We're fighting against tyranny, whether soft or hard. I sincerely hope you have been, you've also learned some things as you've gone through these modules. And I hope they can also be an inspiration for you to continue learning. In time, you will see where your niche is in this good fight. Determine in your heart to use your talents and gifts for good. May God continue to strengthen you and give you peace. Remember, repetition is the key to learning. Therefore, refer back to these lessons often for continued encouragement. It is said we need to hear something five times before we really get it. It takes a while to master any new endeavor. And most of all, do not be discouraged. I've read the book and we win in the end. Stay strong and be eternally minded and vigilant. I am praying for you at every re remembrance. God bless, Alan Hamilton. I probably read the law by Frederick Bastier over 50 years ago. It was one of the first things that enlightened me where I began to see the role of government in uh, trying to portray things as being very helpful for the general good, and yet it turning out to be legal plunder. One of the next books was Econ Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. This one is a short read and really good at describing all of the different uh, financial lies that people throw at us. 
Here are two that maybe you've never heard of. The first one is called Better Not Bigger. The subtitle is How to Take Control of Herbal Growth and Improve Your Community. He does a really good job. This is Ibn Fadar. He does a really good job of showing that bigger is not better. And we see this in most of our communities, especially here in San Antonio. The other one I really enjoyed is Ripples from the Zambezi by Ernesto Ciroli. It's about passion, entrepreneurship, and the rebirth of local economies. He has some really great stories to tell about um, entrepreneurship and the differences it made uh, in some of the different places around the world. Another book I really enjoyed, it was written for kids, but it's got so much truth in it, and that's Paul Revere, uh, sorry, Rush Revere and the Brave Pilgrims. And this one is by Rush Limbaugh. I really miss Rush. He was a great inspiration for many, many years on the radio. And then another name you may have heard of, Naomi Wolf. Uh, she's been very popular on Steve Bannon's show, The War Room. And she wrote this a while back called Give Me Liberty, a handbook for American revolutionaries. I think you'll find some great ideas in that. So some other things available to you is we've also put together a folder called Handouts for Precinct Training. And in the folder, you'll find under the, again, it's under the tab for video training at beargop.org. And there you'll find much more of the handouts mentioned in the modules. And this folder will be updated and added to as we continue to find materials and information to help you to be a better precinct chair. Also, be sure to check out precinctstrategies.com and plan to attend as many conventions as you can. Also, get to know your elected officials go to meetings where they have a chance to speak and ask questions and help to find the good ones and help them to win in primaries and general elections and ask them to help reach the voters in your precinct. So grow the precincts around you also by adopting a precinct. And let's look over these one more time. The first one is one man awake. One man awake awakens another. The second awakens his next door neighbor. And three awake can rouse the town and turn the whole place upside down. And many awake can raise such a fuss that finally awakens the rest of us. One man up with dawn in his eyes multiplies. And also the man who thinks he can. If you think you are beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you like to win, but think you can't, it's almost certain you won't. If you think you'll lose, you're lost, for out of the world we find success begins with a person's will. It's a state of mind. If you think you're outclassed, you are. You've got to think high to rise. You've got to be sure of yourself before you can ever win a prize. Life's battles don't always go to the stronger or faster man, but sooner or later, the man who wins is the man who thinks they can. Well, thanks again. It's been a joy to bring this information to you, put it to good use, and with God's help, we will win.